And so which urine protein study are you gonna send? Do you send the ACR or the PCR or both? Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video where we will be unpacking the difference between the urine albumin creatinine ratio and the protein creatinine ratio. This is a super common question that I get asked all the time and it is super relevant to exams and clinical practice as you'll find out in this video. So stick around till the end. Okay, so to understand the ACR and PCR, there are three ground rules for what's normal and what's not normal when it comes to having protein in the urine. And we're gonna unpack these rules in rapid fire. <laughs> Rule number one, there should be no albumin in the urine in health. So inside the glomerulus, you have the filtration barrier, this filtration barrier allows everything in your plasma to pass through into the tubules, except for two things, blood cells and large proteins like albumin. They're just too big to get through and they should not be in the urine. So that means that if you have a healthy glomerular filtration barrier, there should be absolutely no albumin in your urine. Not one bit of albumin, not a drop, none, because albumin is a big protein and it shouldn't pass through. But there are lots of other little tiny proteins that can and do pass through the filtration barrier, which brings us to rule number two. The proximal tubule recycles small proteins in the filtrate. Yes, you heard me. So proteins which are small enough to make it through the filtration barrier into the proximal tubule are meant to be there and they will be processed here and recycled back into amino acids and returned to the bloodstream. Now, if you are thinking, oh my goodness, Christine, the proximal tubule, I feel like I'm visiting another planet. I don't know what's going on. What is the proximal tubule all about? Do not worry, we have a whole other video on that. Once you're done here, head on over and check out our video on Fanconi syndrome, which is basically a proximal tubule meltdown. <laughs> That'll bring you up to speed on all the things the proximal tubule does. But today, we're gonna stay focused on proteins. So all you need to know for now is that when small proteins make it into the proximal tubule under physiological conditions, they will be recycled and they will be recycled very efficiently because the proximal tubule is a recycling and reabsorption machine. <laughs> it's very good at what it does. So provided the little proteins that end up in the proximal tubule are supposed to be there and within a normal physiological range, the proximal tubule will chomp them up, no worries, and you shouldn't find them in the urine. And the most clinically relevant small protein to mention here are light chains. Light chains, kappa and lambda, are components of antibodies which under normal circumstances are processed in the proximal tubule. Now hold that thought because we'll be returning to light chains very soon. But first, we need to talk about the third and final rule when it comes to protein in the urine, and that's the fact that there is a healthy urine protein that we expect to find there. And this healthy protein is known as TAM horseville protein, or as I like to call him, TAM. He's also known as uromodulin, but that's a bit dull. Let's stick with TAM. TAM is generated in the loop of Henle. And it is highly likely that you have come across TAM already in your clinical practice. For example, have you ever come across a urine microscopy report that mentioned hyaline casts? Well, Hyaline casts are just TAM. Dehydrated TAM, he's a bit parched, but still, that's just TAM. And in fact, any urinary cast is just TAM plus whatever he dragged along with him from the kidney into the urine. So whether it's a red cell cast, white cell cast, any kind of cast, it's just TAM plus the pathological process that he swung by on the way out of the nephron. And TAM is the key reason that we have a normal range for protein in the urine. So you might have noticed that when you send off a 24 hour urine or you perform a urine protein creatinine ratio, there will be a normal value attached to this result. And as humans, we generate anywhere between 50 to 150 milligrams of TAM every single day. So when you look at the normal range of protein in the urine, it's just acknowledging that little sprinkle of TAM that we expect to find there. Okay, so now we have our three rules. 
Number one, albumin should remain in the blood. If the glomerulus is healthy, albumin should not be in the urine. Number two, the proximal tubule is involved in recycling of small physiological proteins which pass into the filtrate and it does this very well and we shouldn't see these proteins in our urine. And number three, the healthy protein that is found in the urine is TAM horsefowl protein, also known as uromodulin. So those are the three rules of protein in the urine in health. Now let's suss out the ACR and PCR. The first thing to say is that the protein creatinine ratio refers to the total amount of protein in the urine, including albumin, whereas the albumin creatinine ratio refers only to the albumin in the urine. So PCR is the total including all albumin and non-albumin proteins and under normal circumstances this should be less than 20 to 30 milligrams per millimole. Cutoffs do vary around the place. Now of course we said before albumin shouldn't really be there and the normal value cutoff for the ACR is less than 3.5 milligrams per millimole. But when albumin is present in significant amounts it will contribute to the value of the ACR, but also the PCR. And the ACR and PCR are great tests because they require only a spot urine collection as opposed to a whole 24 hour urine collection. I mean, how annoying is a 24 hour urine collection? It's most inconvenient to one's day. And nephrologists love ACR and PCR. We can do a spot urine and estimate how many grams of urine would be in the urine in a 24 hour period. So for example, if you have a PCR of 100 milligrams per millimole, that correlates to one gram per day of proteinuria. If it's 200, two grams per day, and so on and so forth. So we nephrologists love a good ACR and PCR, but which one do we use and how do we interpret these tests in clinical practice? Let's find out. So when it comes to pathological conditions causing proteinuria, there are two broad clinical scenarios. There's glomerular proteinuria and there's tubular proteinuria. Let's start with glomerular proteinuria. This is basically albuminuria because we said before, if you have a healthy filtration barrier, albumin should not be in the urine and neither should those red cells. So if you find albumin or red cells in the urine, you have to think, is there something wrong with the glomerulus? So albuminuria is glomerular proteinuria. Whether it's microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria, we're thinking the glomerulus is in a spot of bother. And if someone had a significant amount of albumin in the urine, then that's going to increase the ACR, but also the PCR because the PCR includes the albumin. Now, the correlation between ACR and PCR is not perfect. If you have a teeny tiny amount of albuminuria, then your PCR could be absolutely normal because it's such a small amount. But if you have significant macroalbuminuria, what you find is that the ACR and PCR increase together in a relatively parallel fashion. The PCR will still be higher than the ACR, but the ACR should make up the largest proportion of the PCR when there's a major glomerular issue going down. Again, this correlation is not perfect and can vary due to the patient's unique circumstances, their underlying renal disease, but I came across a really helpful article which looked at this in IgA nephropathy and they found a conversion ratio of 0.84 to turn the PCR into the ACR. And to be honest, that is typically what I find in clinical practice. If I do a rough eyeball test, <laughs> the ACR is typically around 70%-ish or so of the PCR. Okay, so that's glomerular proteinuria. But what about tubular proteinuria? What happens there? And this is so easy. This is all about the gap in PCR to ACR. With tubular proteinuria, the PCR exceeds the ACR by a country mile. And the most important clinical scenario that we see this in is myeloma. In myeloma, there is a plasma cell population that is off chops and it's generating a monoclonal antibody again and again and again and again. And on this antibody, there are light chains, either kappa or lambda. 
And light chains, as we mentioned before, make their way into the filtrate, into the proximal tubule. But the proximal tubule can only do so much, and if there are too many light chains around to chomp up, it might have a meltdown, otherwise known as Fanconi syndrome. See other video. But even without Fanconi syndrome, the proximal tubule might just get saturated. It's at capacity. And so the excess of light chains might head to the distal nephron where they have the potential to cause cast nephropathy and they'll also end up in the urine. And what test do we do to check for light chains in the urine? Ben Stone's proteins. Ben Stone's proteins are just light chains in the urine. So in someone who has myeloma and a lot of light chains in the urine, we commonly see this PCR-ACR gap. Now they might still have some albuminuria because it's very common to have CKD due to diabetes or hypertension at baseline, or even the myeloma itself could be causing glomerular damage as well. But ultimately, when you see this big gap, it's a sign of tubular proteinuria with or without a glomerular problem. And if I see this gap between the PCR and the ACR, I would absolutely be checking for myeloma in that patient. And I'd also double check the proximal tubule health looking for Fanconi syndrome. Now, light chains are not the only source of tubular protein. Of course, if you had an acute kidney injury that caused damage to the tubules, that could lead to extra non-albumin protein in the urine too. But that said, I think it's a neat little concept to know the difference between glomerular proteinuria, meaning albumin, and tubular proteinuria, meaning non-albumin proteins, to make sure that we don't miss an important diagnosis. And now that we have all of that sorted in our minds, let me ask you one more question. When you do a urine dipstick, what are you testing for? Because it says protein on the box, but the answer is albumin. So when you do a dipstick test of the urine, you are checking for albumin in the urine and therefore the health of the glomerulus. You're not checking all of the protein in the urine, so it's entirely possible to have a dipstick that is negative for protein when actually they have myeloma and they have light chains in their urine. So just be aware of that when you do a urine dipstick, you're checking for albumin and it's a screening test. But if you really want to have a think about the health of the nephron, then you want to send off formal studies for proteinuria. And so which urine protein study are you going to send? Do you send the ACR or the PCR or both? Honestly, what I do in my clinical practice, I send both initially. So when I'm working a patient up for chronic kidney disease or an acute kidney injury, I'll actually send both because the combination does give me more information. But then once I've established the diagnosis, I will tailor my approach. So if they have a glomerular pathology, I'll perform the ACR. And the ACR is definitely the preference across the board. If you look at the way we stage chronic kidney disease um, in terms of severity, it's the albumin in the urine that we're taking into account. The albumin is what we consider important for their cardiovascular risk and risk of renal failure, basically. So if you had to choose just one, it's going to be the ACR. But this test is not readily available in every country or setting. Uh, it does come at a high price. And so dipsticks and urine PCR are sometimes used instead as a surrogate marker for the albumin in the urine, when the formal ACR is not available. But I'm very fortunate to work in a place where ACR is readily available, and so I'm using this often. And I'll send off both the ACR and PCR initially when assessing someone for the first time, but I also continue to do both tests for patients uh, with specific conditions when I want to get a, a feel for both their glomerular health and their tubular health. So for example, if someone does have myeloma with lots of light chains, then I might be monitoring a PCR and ACR together along the way. Or another scenario is in patients with HIV and chronic kidney disease when they are on tenofovir, because tenofovir is a potential cause of proximal tubule dysfunction and Fanconi syndrome. And so by performing the ACR and PCR in that context, 
along with other tests, I get a feel for their glomerular and tubular health. So that was the difference between the ACR and PCR and how to interpret them. I really hope this helps your studies and your clinical practice. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to check out our video on Fanconi syndrome. I'll leave a link at the end. And if you are studying for your written exam, be sure to check out all of the goodies over on our website, including the free GN tutorial and of course the Reno for the Written program, which is my new favorite thing. <laughs> we take deep dives into topics in a super fun and enjoyable way. There's live whiteboard teaching with me every single month. It's Reno study reinvented. It's complex made simple and it's nothing like the college lectures. And I would love to see you there. So if you're studying for your written exam, RACP, USMLE, MRCP or your GP exams, there's something for you over on our website. And otherwise, stay tuned here on YouTube for some more higher learning. <laughs> Bye!